today I am going to go searching through a scrap pile to find the cheapest and most readily available wood to build the guitar from. You can find scrap 2x4s and scrap OSB all the time. This stuff here. So, I'd be really excited if I can actually make a guitar out of this stuff. So I, for some reason, am absolutely fixated on building a guitar or bass out of the cheapest and most readily available. Oh, I just saw my hat in the camera. Look at how cool this thing is. These are available on my website, gunsandguitars.net. Back to what I was saying, today I am going to go searching through a scrap pile to find the cheapest and most readily available wood to build the guitar from. Now, I do have access to a scrap pile of barn wood here, but I feel like the barnwood guitar has been done to death. And so I'm not really after that. And lots of people in the United States and all over the world don't actually have access to reclaimed barnwood. But what I feel like everyone has access to are two by fours and OSB. Whether you purchase it just at your local hardware store, or if you know of a construction site or something, you can find scrap two by fours and scrap OSB all the time. I'm looking around for two by fours. Sorry if I'm making you dizzy. Here we go. We got some two by fours here. So I just got to find these are pretty weathered. Still might be kind of cool though. Got some nail holes and stuff. Well, something that will work. And then I think I saw some scrap OSB around here somewhere. This stuff here. Do I want extra weathered, semi weathered, or semi fresh cut? I think I'll probably go with the fresh cut stuff. And that's going to be my top, I think. Yeah, now I just need to go ask permission if I can have this wood, because this is not my property. I'm just camping here. Luke, yo, give me some wood. What kind of wood? Out in the scrap pile. Get some. Okay, cool. Permission granted. <laughs> So today I'm gonna get to gluing my boards together and I'm mooch docking off of the side of my father-in-law's house right here. And I thought it was super funny because I was really stressed at my last spot. Like I need to get this lumber for this build. And I show up to my father-in-law's house and there's like scrap two by lumber and OSB all over the place. So just proof again that these materials are readily available. So I'd be really excited if I can actually make a guitar out of this stuff. So I finished sanding these all down and the edges squared out pretty well, but these are definitely far from true. Now, the right way to do this is to use a table saw or a thickness planer to get all the edges perfectly true so that when everything glues together, it glues together, you know, with perfect engagement. So if you have access to those things, of course, that's the right way to do it, but I actually do have access to those things, being at my father-in-law's house right now, but for the sake of this video, I'm not going to. I'm just going to match these up the best that I can, and I'm just gonna glue them together uh, with some clamps just as is, and I'm gonna just be relying on a lot of glue and a lot of wood filler to fill in all the gaps. So this looks like it's probably gonna be my best bet. I'm a little nervous about this piece right here. So I'm gonna sand a little bit in the middle there. Let's actually, let's go ahead and mark where I'm gonna sand that down. There we go. It's actually not too bad of a system. Orbital is a very productive sander. So if you're going to do it the wrong way, or the Dan Thompson way as I call it, use an orbital, that'll work. Let's go ahead and glue this together. Again, not doing this correctly, because I don't have big, huge clamps to glue them all together. I just have the clamps that came with my workbench. 
and they are only long enough to do three pieces. So I'll glue up three and then two, and then I'll somehow mash the two together. I think I'll go ahead and do the two first, just so I can get a feel for all this gluing stuff. While that glue is drying and clamped, I'm gonna go ahead and start working on my design. I'm gonna do a base, and I've always wanted to see what a Fender Meteora looks like as a base. So that's going to be my inspiration for this build. It's not gonna be an exact copy, stupid wind, because I'm gonna draw it out freehand. So I'm not using any sort of template other than the one that I'm gonna make right here. Here's my awesome high quality k Mize $50 Amazon base neck. And we are just going to kind of doodle up body design. All right, so there we have it. I think I'm done playing with it for now. It's not quite a true Meteora. That's okay, I don't necessarily want to blatantly rip off someone else's design. So um, the offset isn't quite as exaggerated and this bottom part isn't quite as pointy. Um, but I like where this is going, so I'm going to go ahead and stop fiddling it with it for now. It took me about an hour <laughs> to do this, so needless to say, I think my I can remove my clamps from my other wood and start clamping up the other chunk. Now I've come up with an extremely overly complicated and elaborate plan of how I'm going to attach these two blocks of wood together. And it's going to involve setting this thing up in these clamps, and then I'm going to glue this other piece down on top like this, and then I'm going to tighten it down with a ratchet strap. Listen, there's the right way, the wrong way, and the Dan Thompson way, which is really just the wrong way, but faster. Probably the number one thing about my great guitar build-off submission that everybody loved was the headstock. So that was actually my main inspiration for this project was I wanted to take another crack at it because the great guitar build-off happened so fast, it was such a blur, and I pretty much eyeballed all the measurements and I don't even remember how I did it. Um, but what I do remember is that I learned some things about that headstock. Now I'm super proud of how it turned out. I think it turned out amazing. You guys absolutely loved it, but I think there are some ways that it could be improved still. And I think there are some ways that I want to be able to streamline the process, you know, use actual measurements instead of eyeballing everything. So I'm not gonna bore you with the details of how I came up with these measurements or this new design that I'm gonna try out, but really I just wanted to streamline the process and figure out a way that I could repeat it easier. And also come up with some different designs because that other one was very sort of heavy looking and this one I think is gonna be a little bit more light and airy looking, which should match, I think, the body style a little bit better. mess we have here. Tons of glue. I 
again, you got a thickness planer. It's gonna make this job a lot faster. But all I got is an orbital and a lot of 60 grit sanding discs. So let's get started. I have a feeling this is gonna be the piece that I'm gonna glue the top onto since it has the most defects. But I'm gonna sand up both and just see which one looks nicer. Today's the day. We are gonna glue the OSB onto my plank of two by fours. I've got six cheap Harbor Freight clamps standing by. I also have two extremely heavy toolboxes. Yeah, I'm just gonna add a ton of glue to the backside of the OSB everywhere as much as possible. And then I'm gonna flip it over, clamp it down in the spots that are not even around the perimeter, and then place my big heavy toolboxes in the middle to just really squeeze out the excess glue and get as firm of engagement as possible. So hopefully this works. And as I cut out my body, if I find little gaps in the glue or whatever, that's what the wood filler is for. As long as it's structurally sound, that's all I really care about. So we'll go ahead and let this dry pretty much all day. So I'm sort of going to jump forward a step. I traced out my body and normally I would just cut this out if this was normal wood. But this isn't normal wood, this is OSB. And the problem with working with OSB is that these little wafers, they tend to peel up and chip and tear out whenever you're cutting or routing them. So to make kind of the rest of this a little bit easier, I'm going to go ahead and do my grain filling. Now my grain filler is gonna be a little bit different recipe than I would typically do if I was just filling an open grain on some wood. I'm going to start with just some all-purpose sandable, stainable wood filler. And normally I would mix in some stain just to make the grain the color that I want it to be. So I will be doing that, but in order to help kind of glue down these wafers, I'm going to need to mix in a gluey substance. So I'm gonna be mixing in a polyurethane uh, I just found that once I did that, this stuff was so much easier to work with. Now it's not gonna fix all the problems with tear out and wafers peeling. Some of that's still gonna happen, but it is gonna make my life a whole heck of a lot easier. To keep the recipe not super complicated, I'm gonna go ahead and use this poly shade, which is a stain and poly that's already mixed to the perfect ratio. And then I'm just gonna mix that with the wood filler till I get the perfect consistency that I want. And that consistency really is just going to be sort of a thick syrupy substance that I can press into all these little gaps and holes. And then the polyurethane, we're gonna let it cure and it's gonna harden and it's gonna help keep those wafers down while I jigsaw out this body design, route for pickup cavities, all that kind of stuff. Right, look at how this came out. I am very happy for not having the right stuff, for not being able to chew up the two by fours, for not you know having a planer, not having the right clamps. I mean, this looks like one solid chunk of wood here. Um, there are pretty much no gaps. I was nervous there were gonna be a ton of gaps between my top and the two by fours. There's only really two. There's a little bit right there and a little bit right there, both of which 
I'm just gonna have to fill in with some wood filler, which I honestly had anticipated on doing a lot more than just those two spots. So overall, I'm feeling really good. You can see I only had minimal tear out of these wafers. So I think doing that grain filling first was helpful. Um, it was really just the really tight spots or the spots where I put it on really thin were the parts that tore out. And so um, I'm gonna be running that over anyway. And like I said, I'm gonna do the grain fill again. So it's gonna be nice and smooth, but I'm gonna leave it like this until I get everything done all the pickup routes and the bridge placement and all that stuff because I expect to have more tear out. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave this as is until it's time to finish it and then we'll do it again. I also gotta say that cutting all this out only took me about 15 minutes. I mean, uh, probably a little bit less and that's including drilling the extra holes to get my jigsaw in there. So just something to consider. Yeah, a bandsaw would have been faster, but how much faster? Five minutes, maybe even 10 minutes. Is it worth the expense? If you're building guitars all day, every day, yeah, it's worth the expense. You'll make that money back in your time eventually. But if this is just a hobby, you can certainly get by with a jigsaw. Now I'm gonna take my 60 grit disc and just clean up these sides a little bit, especially these corners. Now I know I'm gonna get a lot of comments, people telling me that I routed this P pickup cavity upside down. Um, Cause traditionally you would see it like this, right? I did that on purpose cause the way I'm designing my pick guard, I want it to cover up that extra space to really streamline it a bit. So it should look just like a standard, I don't know, single coil guitar pickup without having this little extra part right here where they have to solder the wires on. So, and now that I've got my template cut out, of cardstock and go ahead and make my wood pick guard. I'm not gonna show you guys how I do that because I have a video dedicated to it. So just gonna knock that out real quick and then we'll get back to finishing this thing. Now you're gonna finally get to see what I'm trying to do here with the OSB and the wood grain filler as I'm calling it. So you can see how the grain filler just filled in all the little tiny gaps in between the wood. And this just looks beautiful. This is exactly how I was hoping it would turn out. Uh, the only issue is of course, we did have some more tear out. So where this should feel like glassy smooth, there's just a few little tiny spots that need to be patched. So I'm gonna grain fill the whole thing again.
pretty good. Now time for some 120 grits. Now it's very important when you're hand sanding OSB that you sand it with the grain. And in this case, the grain is that direction. Now that it's all sanded, we can stain it. I'm gonna do the back and sides with Minwax True Black, and then the top, I'm gonna do some water-based writ dyes. I do really like the look of the black stain, and it's gonna really allow us to still see that this was made out of two by fours. I really wanna show that off, because that to me is the coolest part about this build, is just knowing that it's made out of completely junk pile wood. So because of my extreme distaste for sanding, uh, I'm trying out another accessory. It's right here. It's a little like Velcro on kind of spongy pad. I love the orbital, but one of the shortcomings is that it works best on flat surfaces, curved surfaces, not so much. So this sponge, I think is gonna really help it contour. Oh my goodness, that's amazing, that's incredible. That, this one time was worth this purchase. Oh, that's so amazing, so amazing. You know, I'm gonna put on a 320 pad and I think I'm gonna do this neck. I don't know why they don't come with these from the factory. This is so much better. Oh, I'm so happy about these. All of these transitions, this right here, this right here, down at the heel, so smooth. Oh, I love this, this is wonderful. Sides and back are stained with that oil-based Minwax. And now I'm gonna do the front with just black liquid writ dye. Now time for a little bit of cherry red. Sort of the last thing before I put my clear coat finish on this. You guys know that I always like to sort of make my guitars look a little worn out or a little broken in. So I'm gonna attempt to do that. Hopefully I don't ruin this because this is beautiful. I wonder if I could dye the grain on this. Give it an orange tint. That looks pretty cool. Let's try that. Since I sanded it back a little bit, it did expose a little bit of bare wood where that grain is. That's good, I've never done that. I've never done a water-based dye on top of an oil-based stain. But, I gotta say, I like the results. So today I'm gonna to do something that's probably considered a big no-no in the guitar fretwork business. And that's, I'm not gonna do any sandpaper. I'm just gonna go straight from the fret file to polishing. And doing that for a couple of reasons. One, I mentioned that this is sort of an experimental base. I don't plan to sell it. I just wanna try out some new ideas on it. And so I am just going to see if I can get a good playing base, even if the frets aren't super perfectly mirror polished shiny. And so as long as it still operates smoothly, I think it'll be 
just fine. So they may not be as pretty, but going straight to polishing, at least it'll make the smooth parts where the string's touching nice and smooth. And hopefully, I don't know, we'll just see, we'll find out. So as long as I'm breaking all the rules, I might as well just go the full distance. I tried another new idea, and that's where I just took my cloth polishing wheel from my Dremel, and I went across, after I was done, I didn't add any more compound, but I just, whatever was left on there, I used to polish all the fret ends. Usually I just sand them with 320 and that makes them good enough, but this gave me really good smooth results that I love. It's a big no-no because you can see that I just really dirtied up this edge of the fretboard, but I kind of like the look of it. It looks kind of worn out, kind of toasted. I don't care if something looks ugly as long as it's extremely functional. And uh, if this gets me perfect results while looking a bit ugly, why not, right? So I didn't really film myself doing the poly finish on this thing and because that's just boring. Who wants to watch me rub poly on a guitar body? Um, but when I was lightly sanding between coats to get this smooth satin non-glossy finish to make it look more like the wood that it's made out of, you guys know that I'm a huge fan of guitars that are made of wood. I think should look and feel like they're made of wood. But I decided to take that uh, worn out look to the next level. And sorry I didn't film this, but I just sanded right around these contoured areas to give a little separation of color between the black and the orange. And I wasn't super happy with how the finish was turning out up until that point. And I feel like that was what it really needed. So I ended up doing it to the pick guard as well. You can see that I kind of highlighted the edges just by running some sandpaper along it. And that really makes it pop a bit more. And then, didn't feel like the neck really matched all that much. So I ended up adding a little bit of color to kind of make the neck look a little more worn out to kind of match. Headstock, I think turned out awesome. Um, it's kind of take two on my great guitar build off design. And this thing is really coming together. So I'm excited today I get to assemble it. And for the wiring on this thing, it's gonna be really complicated. I got a single pickup going to a single output jack. That's right, I'm not gonna do a volume or tone on this one. As a bass player, I don't ever use my volume and tone. I have a tuner pedal that I use to mute myself when I don't wanna play, but other than that, I don't ever use a volume or a tone. I know it's just me personally, but I'm not building this bass to sell, I'm building it for me, and so I'm not gonna waste time on that. If I wanna add a second bridge pickup later on down the road, I can always add that wiring later. I've got enough room to put in a couple volume pots um, or a selector switch or something, so. No problems there, but yeah, just uh, hot and ground to the output jack and then a ground to the bridge, done. fully assembled, I realized that the translucent finish on the pit guard just wasn't doing it for me. I think the wood grain was just a little bit too busy for the chaos of the OSB. So at the opinion of my wife and those in my Guns and Guitar Secret Facebook VIP group, we decided collectively that a solid black finish would really just tie this together. So I went ahead and stripped off the translucent black minwax stain and I ended up putting on that black poly shade that I used for the grain filler and then going around the edges of it with some sandpaper to make it pop like I did before and then also using that sandpaper to distress it kind of relic it a little bit and that was what this base really needed to tie it all together I mean you got a matte black pickup matte black block inlays we got the matte black and the headstock it really just ties it all together you also notice that I used a Fender Stratocaster style output jack and I mounted it upside down from what you're used to seeing. And that's because every professional musician that I know ties relief of their cable through their strap. So it actually makes more sense for it to be upside down. You know, sort of a form follows function thing. I don't know why they've never updated that. Now in this video, I intentionally didn't tell you anything about this pickup right here. And that's because this pickup is a very cool special pickup 
that deserves a video in and of itself. So if you want to see what kind of 51P style pickup I used and you want to hear just a pure tone sound demo, stick around because I'll be uploading that video next week. Also, if you have a real keen eye, you'll notice that this bridge is actually the same type of bridge I used on my great guitar build off build. And I want to do a dedicated review video to this bridge as well because it's super innovative. It's not very common for there to be a leap in electric guitar technology right? Especially when it comes to bass. We've been doing the same thing for like 60 years. So having this completely newly designed innovative bridge is a super game changer for us bass players. And I can't wait to make a dedicated video to that as well. So stick around. I'm Dan, this is Guns and Guitars, and I'll see you in those videos.